Hello, future Boilermakers, and welcome to our YouTube live broadcast for the School of Aviation and Transportation Technology in the Polytechnic Institute of Purdue University. First, I want to say congratulations to our student viewers who have been admitted to one of our majors here in the Polytechnic, and we're so glad you could join us for our panel discussion to give you some insight and information about our aviation technology department. Uh, we have several faculty members, an academic advisor, and two current students with us who will be our panelists, and we'll have them introduce themselves here in a minute. Uh, but we also want to have we also have several topics and prepared questions for them that we will ask. But we also want to know what you want to know. So you can sign into uh, the Google the YouTube chat by using your Google account and submitting your questions through the the YouTube chat function. Um, our technical director John O'Malley and I will be watching that chat and sending in some questions to our panelists. Uh, in addition to the questions that we've already prepared. So if we don't get to your question tonight, please feel free to send us a follow-up email to techrecruit at purdue.edu and we'll respond to those later on. So with that, I'll turn to our panelists and have them introduce themselves with their name, their position in the college or major for our students, and then a little bit about the courses that they teach for our faculty members. So we'll start off with Brian. Hello, my name is Brian Dillman. I'm an associate professor uh, in the School of Aviation and Transportation Technology. I teach in the flight program, but predominantly in the freshman and sophomore years. Although I'm a designated pilot examiner, and so I do flight tests for our students throughout the entirety of their curriculum. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, next up, Jacob. Hi, everybody. My name is Jacob Bartholomew. I am a senior in the flight program, and I am from Muncie, Indiana. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, next up, Mike. Hello, everybody. I'm Mike Davis, and I'm an assistant professor in the Aeronautical Engineering Technology Plan Study. Uh, now, as far as um, we have the air, airframe and power plant certificate falls under, and I am the Part 147 Program Director. So, uh, welcome aboard tonight. All right. Thank you, Mike. Next up, John. Yeah, thank you. My name is uh, John Zokowski. I'm a flight operations quality assessment manager. So I deal with um, a lot of our flight program and making sure we're on track to meet our goals. I also am a senior lecturer and teach a lot of the uh, courses that freshmen and sophomores in the flight program would take. Okay, thanks, John. Next up, Casey. Everyone. Um, my name is Casey Richardson. I am an academic advisor in the School of Aviation and Transportation Technology. Um, we currently have four academic advisors on staff, and so you all will be assigned to one of us. All right. Thanks, Casey. And last but not least, Peter. Good evening. I'm Peter DiNatale. I'm a junior in aviation management and airline management uh, with a minor in management. All right, thank you all for the introduction. So we'll start out with some questions for our faculty members, um, just to get a sense of how the courses and, and what our students can ex expect to experience um, when they're taking their courses are. So kind of how are they designed? Um, we'll start with Brian and then move to Mike and then follow up with John and, and kind of what to expect there. Yeah, so as you'd expect, the flight courses are fairly hands-on. Um, you know, the uh, structure within the lab courses themselves or you'd be one-on-one -on -one with an instructor. Um, the lecture courses, of course, our groups of students. Um, and so we try as hard as we can to align those courses that are both lecture courses and the flight courses um, so that the material that you're learning in the lecture room uh, has direct applicability to what's happening on the flight line. Um, the, uh, the content is real world. Um, you're actually out there doing flight training. Uh, it's called training, although it's real world environment. And uh, we strive as hard as we can to make it uh, fun and enjoyable and challenging at the same time. All right, Mike, what do what you uh, got for us in terms of the AET program? Well, as far as the AET program, of course, I teach the turbine classes. And then those right now are presently in the plan study. They're toward the junior senior level. Now, uh, going forward, we as of fall 2020, our plan of study went under went under a complete uh, rewrite, and now the A and P part of that program is accomplished in the first two and a half years. So, where we used to have a minor that students could sign up for to get, if they were interested in the FA Part 147 airframe and power plant, they could. Now, everybody will be in that plan. If they choose to go after that certification, they may. If they choose not to, that is their call. 
So then uh, as far as the, the courses, all of our courses, since we are uh, FAA certificated, we have to offer so many hours. Currently, Part 147 requires that we have a, at least a minimum of 1,900 hours seat time. Now, of course, that's all blended into the, the AET program. By changing it to the way we did to where it's in the first two and a half or the first five semesters, first two and a half years, that actually frees us up to follow into more advanced uh, curriculum uh, criteria, things like that, because where we were tied with the program going through the four years, now by bringing it back to two and a half for that first portion, that allows us to get into the more uh, heavy, you know, large transport category aircraft, more of the research, uh, fuels research, uh, as far as I've even got some research projects going with manufacturers on ignition systems for turbine engines, things like that. So we actually have the the complete run up engine test cells. So we've got a turbo fan and one engine, one test cell. We've got a large turbo prop and another test cell. So, and then our labs are situated to where we have the same equipment that you would see on live aircraft. And so we've got engine power plant labs, we've got hydraulic labs, we've got avionics labs. So everything falls along with that. And then for each one of those labs, we would have lectures that would go along with that program. So now the other thing that's brewing in the next two days, the FAA will be coming out with a completely revised part 147. That's going to be the first revision to that uh, program in over 50 years. So there's some new things. Uh, you're, you're coming to Purdue at a perfect time. You're going to see some brand new things going on with Part 147 and how uh, the requirements to complete a certification and those type things. So, um, you know, it's really, uh, really quite a great time to be uh, signing up, coming to Purdue. We can show you all kinds of new uh, advanced technology. We've got Hangar of the Future. We've got a Actually, we've got an aircraft simulator that we've moved into that particular area. So uh, we're using it for both power plant, both airframe, because we can go in and simulate different faults right on that simulator as far as, you know, engine hot starts, over temps, those type things. So that's, that's just a little bit of what's going on. And then I do have a, there's another course that's part of our program. If you choose to take it, it would be an elective. And that's an AT-477 course where you can actually go down to, once you get to about midway through your studies, you can go down to the Hangar 6 area, work with the technicians on the live aircraft. So just something else to think about. All right, thanks, appreciate all that good info and, and good to hear that we're adjusting, obviously, with that that new 147 requirements. That, that oh, you bet. <laughs> all right, and then uh, John, for you, um, I think you mentioned you're in the flight operations and we actually got a good question from the chat already about getting flight hours for for freshmen. How does that look for them? And, and in addition to you know just what you what you do in your normal coursework as well. Yeah, Ryan. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I uh, just a brief introduction. Right. I'm a graduate of our flight program, but 18 years ago, I was sitting where most of you students are sitting on the cusp of needing to make a decision. I, I knew aviation was a passion and looked around and, and found a lot of things that Purdue did differently. Um, a decade and a half later, I'm, I'm back here on faculty, and I, I think this dovetails nicely into your question, Ryan, um, that, that you received from the chat. Part of my job uh, in our flight operations, um, it's a rather new role within the past year, so I've occupied this role as part of being hired, and it's a flight operations quality assessment manager. So I, I think, you know, there's a lot of places in the country you can go to just train the stick and rudder skills to be a pilot to get the flight hours. One of the things I think we do well here at Purdue and we're ever adapting is trying to plan and dedicate flight hours to students. So if you are enrolled in a class, you know, what we're committing to you is we have an instructor, we have an aircraft, you have a scheduled flight slot and you show up and ideally all those things will be present for you. Uh, rather than having to have you come to the airport and fight for flight slots, um, you know, I'm not saying we're 100%, right? Uh, we have unplanned maintenance events that occur. We have a, a world-class uh, maintenance operation that keeps these aircraft airworthy and at a, in a tip-top shape. Uh, safety is number one in everything we do. 
Uh, but my role in the department is to begin to use real-time data to identify students who may be falling a little behind where their peers are and, and make live on-the-fly adjustments to try and catch those students early so that they're not falling behind and, and continue to get them flight hours. Uh, essentially, a, a freshman student, I think to directly answer your question, Ryan, a freshman student will come in, uh, be assigned a, uh, if they're in our professional flight program, will be assigned a flight slot. And um, that meets just like any other university laboratory class. So um, it appears on your schedule, you come in, you're given a, an instructor and an aircraft, um, and the um, availability to complete your required amount of hours every semester, right? Now, one of the things when I was in your position, uh, not to dwell on this, that I, I thought Purdue did well, is we had uh, guaranteed flight slots, right? We don't make you come and try and uh, beg, borrow, and steal to get flight time. You know, we set aside an aircraft, we set aside an instructor, and give you uh, the class on a schedule to complete within a semester. So all of those things ideally will lead to you walking away second, some second year at the end of your second year uh, with your private, commercial, and instrument and multi-engine rating. Now, uh, part of my role is to begin to uh, evaluate students and their targets every semester to make sure that they they meet that target. So um, I have a lot more to say, but I hope that answers your question specifically uh, about the flight slots. No, that's that's good to hear that it shows up on a schedule and it's really just part of their normal operations as in terms of like their, their class schedules. That's really good to hear. Um, and then Peter, you're in our aviation management program. So that's only gonna be a little bit different, I think. So could you give us a rundown of what those classes are like and what kind of things you're doing in those courses as well? Sure, so the aviation management program is gonna be similar to a uh, business program where you're learning about the industry um, and how things work. Um, and preparing you for a role in the industry. And now I would say that the aviation management program at Purdue uh, is very airline heavy, um, but it does touch on other areas such as airports um, and other, other uh, businesses in the industry. But I would say a lot of my coursework is analyzing data, uh, learning about the different strategy, uh, strategic management of, of an airline, and also marketing and things like that. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in the airline, and I think that Purdue's coursework and aviation management helps to uh, build that knowledge and prepare you for, for an entry-level role uh, in the industry. All right, very good. Thank you. Appreciate that. And, and Jacob, being a senior in professional flight, you're uh, almost done, just a little about a month away. Uh, could you give us some of your experiences, what you've enjoyed you know, throughout your time here in the program? Yeah, so uh, right now I'm finishing up some of our turbine flight operations courses. So uh, last semester I was in our full motion uh, Hawker 900 simulator, and this semester I'm in the A320 sim. So uh, kind of just jumping into that course right now. It's the second, it's a second eight weeks course. Um, so we've gone all the way from startup to shutdown, and we're going to start doing our uh, full flights in that soon. So that's a lot of fun information, a lot to, lot to tackle with uh, an advanced aircraft like that. but. Um, it's, it's really valuable. I can already see how it's going to pay off uh, and produce decision to bring those in. And then, like John was saying, uh, one of the things that I've liked about being here is you do get your assigned flight time. So I didn't have trouble finishing any of my courses. Everything I was able to get done was able to get an airplane, get an instructor, um, had different instructors each semester. Uh, everyone was, every one of them was great. They're student instructors. And that gives you the opportunity to learn um, everybody's got, you know, slightly different things that they do or different ways of teaching. Uh, so you get to see how all of that kind of comes together and learn different ways. So that was really valuable as well. All right, excellent. And, and I want to turn back to Brian real quick because you heard, you know, simulators and different aircraft. And I just want to get a quick rundown of what's available. What does the department look like? What are the different simulator experiences that our students can get in, involved with this program? Yeah, so our, our primary aircraft that we use for the first several courses uh, is a Piper Archer. Uh, that's the aircraft you'll, you'll be in for the first three courses. Um, we do have uh, two uh, instrument courses that you're working as you're working on your instrument rating that are in what we would call an aviation training device or an, an AATD, Advanced Aviation Training Device. Uh, we have two manufacturers of those devices. They're modeled off after the Piper Archer as well. 
um, both uh, Frasca and uh, Tink Flight, or I'm sorry, Flight One Tech uh, devices that uh, have created those uh, those those uh, those devices. Um, <clears throat> we also have four uh, Piper Arrows that we use uh, for complex uh, aircraft training. Uh, one of the requirements for the commercial certificate is you have 10 hours of training in a complex aircraft. Uh, so currently we're using those aircraft to satisfy that requirement. We have two Piper Seminoles that we use for our multi-engine training. Uh, we have one um, American Champion Super Decathlon that we use for um, uh, spin training for the CFI. And uh, we're looking at uh, possibly revitalizing uh, some aerobatic uh, aspects uh, for coursework that we've done in the past and in, uh, in reinstituting that within the program. Uh, the simulation technology that Jacob mentioned earlier, we have a, a level D um, full motion sim. It's a it's a Hawk, Hawker 900 XP, so it's a it's a corporate style aircraft. Uh, the level D sim is the is the penultimate type of technology. It's the highest level of technology, real world. Um, it's as close to real world you possibly get within a simulator. Um, full fidelity uh, operates uh, exactly like the aircraft. It's the same level of technology that the airlines would use. Uh, as they train their pilots <clears throat> to go onto the flight line. <clears throat> then we also have a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, an A320, an Airbus A320, as well as a Boeing 737. Those are those are level five FTDs. Um, so as far as the the fidelity and the and the the, um, the 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 rigor of the the technology, the AATDs are the lowest level. The FTDs are the middle level, and then the level D sim is the highest level. So the A320 and the uh, Boeing 737 are the two devices that we have that we use in the uh, senior course, uh, AT-487. And we, we teach a certain aspect of aircraft control <clears throat> within those courses, but the predominant aspect that we're trying to facilitate is trying to understand design characteristics within the different platforms. So looking at Boeing versus Airbus. So Jacob is currently in the Airbus. Uh, he may, may or may not be aware of this, but in the last couple of weeks of his eight week term, He'll, he'll then do a flip flop <clears throat> into the uh, 737, you know, compare and contrast the 73 against the A320 in the uh, design philosophy and the operation of that airplane. All right, very good. Good to hear all that. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Mike real quick. We had a question from the chat, and if you just speak briefly about the difference you would say and, and that, would, that exists between the AET program and the aeronautical astronautical program in the College of Engineering here at Purdue. Oh, okay. So both programs would have the, the math and science blended in. Now the engineering is going to be more of the design work, whereas the AET would be more of the technologist. So, uh, you know, I mentioned the airframe and power plant, that is just a portion. So the rest of the, uh, the plan of study actually takes you down and gets you prepared to go out into industry as far as a, maybe a quality engineer, uh, you know, quality managers, project managers, We've got students that have gone to the Boeings, they've gone to Lockheed, uh, Pratt & Whitney, GE. I mean, even Caterpillar has picked up some of ours just because of the, they know that our students have shown the, gone through the work as far as the turbochargers and they understand the airflows and the, you know, everything that goes along as far as the technology with that. So uh, some of our students are actually, have been hired by Chrysler Powertrain. And so they're, they're kind of all over, but they, they know that what uh, the, the program kind of situates them to kind of go into whatever area they're interested in. I, I actually teach one of the Lean Six Sigma advanced manufacturing courses, which we take them to the GE here in town. And they actually get to go through and see how that leap engine is manufactured, get to uh, see uh, kind of what goes into the engineering side of it. But uh, basically I would describe our students in AET as students that would be more of a liaison and they understand the technology side where they can relate it to the engineers and the technology or the maintainers that actually work with that equipment each and every day. So we've had programs set up where our students have gone to the Deltas, the Americans, um, some of those as interns, as uh, just uh, research projects to where we've gone through that. And we put them right in the trenches to kind of analyze what's going on with the, the maintenance side of it. Uh, most of our students are not going to turn wrenches. We have that airframe and power plant certification as a professional certification that they can earn and they can carry that with them for their entire life if they'd like. And we always describe that as just an opportunity to, it's, it's kind of like your street credentials to where uh, if you do go to work as a, a manager with an airline or something like that, it tends to give you a little bit more credibility with the folks that are going to be working for you. 
So uh, as soon as this COVID is over, I've got a deal set up to where our students, we're going to be taking them up to Chicago O'Hare. And uh, American Airlines has offered to bring them, to have our students come in there with them so they can see exactly what goes on in the overnight inspections, what it takes to actually prepare these aircraft for the daily flights. And so we've just, it was actually set up for last year. And then once the, once we were uh, kind of quarantined from COVID, we had to put that on the back burner. But some of our students are actually in the, uh, Air, the military, and they're going to go into the different military career fields. So we actually prepare like the maintenance officers uh, going into the Air Force and the Navy, Marine Corps to where they're going to be able to understand exactly what those troops are going through to prepare those fighters and those bombers on a day to day operation. So uh, that's where we have. Uh, I don't know if you knew it, but Purdue has one of the largest ROTC contingencies in the US. So we we see a lot of those cadets out in our program, whether it's AET uh, management or flight. So they're kind of, and uh, so they're being prepped to kind of go to those different areas to help protect this country. So that is kind of where we uh, we blend in. We have pretty regular uh, contact with our industry advisors and partners. And, uh, you know, we Southwest has donated a CFM 56, which is off of one of their 737s. So we actually have that sitting in the power plant lab. For instance, we just had, you saw in the news where we had this, uh, the blade failure on the uh, the Pratt & Whitney engine. We actually, I pulled the service bolt and we took students out and we actually did a blade inspection because we have a Pratt & Whitney 4098. Now, the good thing is our blades had the good part number. So we, uh, but we talked about exactly the, the design criteria of those blades, what goes in, what could have caused that uh, defect to break that blade. And then we look at how the, the dynamics of that blade coming out of the engine and how it could have, uh, the different damage it could have done to the fan cow and things like that. So that's that's just some of the areas that we get into. All right, very good. It seems like you know, a lot of hands-on good understanding of what's happening in the industry overall with that, with that kind of training and coursework. So good to hear. Um, John, John, I'm gonna turn it back to you real quick. We had a question um, from the chat. Is, is, it, is it freshmen can get extra flight time on top of what's normally scheduled for them? And then we're gonna turn it over to Casey for some advising related things as well after you're done. Perfect, thank you, Ryan. Um, yes, uh, whether you're a freshman, I know that was the specific question, whether you're a freshman or all the way, you know, sophomore, junior, if you're in our flight training program, uh, extra time is always available. Um, we, we call this lottery time. Uh, this is uh, gaps that are in the schedule, students who maybe couldn't fly because of a health-related concern that day or a weather-related concern earlier in the day caused them to cancel a flight slot or maybe uh, aircraft came out of maintenance and is now available. Uh, we do have openings in the schedule and part of my role in coming on board is to make this more real time. Uh, we used to lottery for slots a day in advance. Um, that is, if it was a Wednesday you were trying to fly on Tuesday, you would attempt to um, come in and, and uh, you know, do a lottery system in an attempt to, to grab an extra slot and then next day. Uh, part of what I'm trying to implement is as my role of quality assessment in our flight operations is to transition this, you know, over a period of a couple semesters here into a real time situation where students can um, identify available flight slots and take advantage of them. Uh, certainly, if you are uh, one pillar of success in, in our flight program is to be absolutely motivated, to be willing to come out at 730, even on a Saturday, to attempt to get every available slot. I mean, you will be more than successful. The uh, uh, difference here is we don't require that you do that in order to be successful. Um, you do need to show up to your minimum scheduled flight slots, but we also encourage students who want to get done quicker through the semester um, to take advantage of lottery slots uh, when able. Certainly, the more motivated you are, uh, the quicker you'll finish your semester's flight requirements. All right, very good. And, and I think I've had this question before when talking with families. Could you just real quick, what's an average flight, a number of flight hours that students graduate with in the flight program? Well, I mean, I mean, that really depends. I guess I could defer a little bit to uh, Professor Dillman uh, on that. 
Um, it, it depends, right? Because uh, students take different paths forward. If a, a student goes on to get their CFI, their Certified Flight Instructor Certificate from the FAA, uh, then they can turn around and become a student flight instructor within our program uh, as a junior or senior who would then instruct the freshman or sophomore students uh, in the aircraft. So if they take that route to become a CFI, certainly they're uh, going to get more than the 250 or 300 hours that they would have gotten during their private instrument uh, uh, commercial and um, multi-engine training. So um, I guess I could defer to Brian because he uh, does more of our flight testing, but I, I would say, you know, we, we um, it really depends. And if you're after flight hours, the, the path would probably to be to get your CFI. Yeah, Ryan, just to, just to follow up with that. So our students are gonna graduate uh, generally around 300 hours as a minimum. Uh, if they get their CFI in the summer between their sophomore and junior year, which is typical, they're going to graduate with somewhere between 500 and 700 hours, depending on how active they are in the summers. Typically, uh, we have had some of our students um, that have graduated with the thousand hour requirement to meet the restricted ATP. Um, but most of our graduates are going to have to instruct or do some flight time building activity for somewhere between six to eight months after graduation in order to hit that thousand hour mark. Okay, good to know. I know I've gotten that question before. I'm sure people are out there wondering as well. All right, so I'm gonna turn it back over to, to Casey, um, our academic advisor, just to get some um, information about, we've got some good questions about courses and double majors, things like that. But I wanna first start with, um, for those students who will you know, eventually accept their offer if you haven't already, um, what is the virtual STAR process gonna look like? So summer transition advising and registration when they meet with their academic advisor for the first time. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, so students will uh, gain access to the VSTAR module uh, beginning on, on May 10th. Um, you, will, you will complete that module um, at your own pace, but I would encourage you to complete it uh, sooner than later um, because you, uh, once you've completed that, your advisor will receive notification that you have uh, completed that module. We will reach out to you via email um, so make sure you're checking your Purdue email, uh, email address. Um, we will invite you to schedule an appointment with your academic advisor. That will be a one-on-one -on -one appointment. Um, you will schedule that appointment. The earlier you uh, finish your VSTAR and uh, schedule your appointment, the more availability there will be and more flexibility there will be in those appointments. Um, we will uh, include it in that email that we send you, um, inviting you to schedule an appointment. We will also include other uh, really important details, some information um, about items you will want to have with you when you meet with your advisor, um, a few tasks that you will want to complete. Um, we often send out a survey uh, to gain some information uh, before we meet with you. Um, to help us understand what math courses you might be um, in a position to take um, uh, if, you've, if you've taken AP courses um, uh, or if you have other transfer credits that you're bringing in. So um, it, you'll want to keep an eye on your email um, and make sure that you're reading those emails in complete detail. Um, the first day of, of our advising will be June 1st. Um, so while uh, the the uh, module opens on May 10th. Uh, you will want to schedule an appointment. June 1st will be the soonest appointment you can schedule. Um, and those appointments will go from June 1st until June 30th. Um, so definitely make sure you're not waiting until June 29th or 30th to complete your VSTAR module. Uh, I can almost guarantee you that your advisor will not have any availability in that short of notice. So. Um, that's our plan right now. Uh, we're still working on some details, but uh, that's that's what we've put together so far, and it's worked well in the past. So. I think it's a good way to, to understand, you know, start early and, and get that process going as, as soon as you can. So good to know. Um, we had some questions earlier, and I got one emailed to me, and then another one from the chat um, related to students who come in with their private pilot's license already completed. Um, so what would they be doing in that first semester instead of that private coursework? And then for those who opt into the, to the degree in three program, um, if you can speak to that, or maybe Brian might be able to chime in on that a little bit later as well. What would that look like for those students too? 
So for students who are coming in with their private pilot's license, uh, they will receive credit for AT145, which is the, the, the private pilot license uh, flight course. Um, we offer a, a test out for the, the lecture portion of that course as well. Um, that's typically uh, the Friday before uh, classes begin. Um, so you will be able to, to take that test out exam. Um, if you pass that exam, you'll, you will receive credit for AT144 as well. Um, if you come in with those things, your first flight course, uh, you will skip that first, the, the private pilot license flight course, um, and jump straight into uh, to the next course on the list. Um, I don't know, Brian, if you want to chime in and share a little bit more information. I, I... No, Casey, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, the, the second flight course is uh, AT243. And uh, regardless of whether a student uh, tests out of 144 or not, they are allowed to continue on with their flight training. So, you know, complete or continuing your flight training is not contingent upon um, you passing both AT, uh, well, passing the test out for AT 144. Um, you would do that, um, make up work, you know, and, and, and basically round out the ground training that you've received as you're working through your private certificate um, at wherever you receive that training at the same time that you're pursuing or continuing on with your education for 243. Now, the, the degree in three that Ryan mentioned, um, that's an accelerated program. Um, the, the benefit of the degree in three is that you are able to graduate in three years. Uh, the downside, if there, if you want to consider it a downside, is that you are pretty well scripted in the courses that you will be taking. There's not a lot of freedom in the, the extra aspects of the coursework. Um, we've, we've laid out the plan of study very specifically um, for the, the courses that you have to take. Uh, you will be required to stick around uh, for a couple summers to ensure that you continue your flight training, but you will be able to graduate at the completion of the three years. Uh, one other benefit that I want to mention is that um, the degree in three students are uh, placed into a cohort and they are batch enrolled by the registrar's office. And so there's no fighting for space within any of the courses that were that are within our plan of study. And that includes all the courses on campus, as well as the courses within uh, the School of Aviation Transportation Technology. All right, that's good to know. Thank you, Brian, for that rundown for the degree in three. Um, another question related to double majoring. Um, Casey, if you could kind of give us a, an insight as how you work with our students on that, especially for those who are in professional flight. I think that was the, the question that came in, but just in general uh, for the majors within the AT department. Yeah, so we do have um, quite a few students who will pursue professional flight and aviation management um, or our aerospace financial analysis program. Um, there, this is something that you would want to mention to your advisor as soon as, um, as soon as you recognize that that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, you will uh, want to st strategically choose courses um, so you're, you're uh, fulfilling requirements for both plans of study where you're able to do that. Um, the, uh, some of our other programs, so the, the AET program, um, that plan of study is, is pretty significantly different than um, our professional flight or aviation management programs. Um, so there's not as much overlap. It's, it is still possible. Um, it may uh, require some extra time, um, uh, summers or, or staying an extra semester or two, depending on, um, depending on the situation. But uh, it is possible to, to double major within, uh, within SATT. Um, the, it's also possible to double major uh, with an SATT uh, major and a major outside of um, SATT. That's again going to be a very individualized plan and, and requires a lot of strategic uh, working ahead and thinking about how you will meet the requirements for, your, for, for both majors simultaneously. Okay, good to know. And I think that's pretty standard for really any of the majors here at Purdue, just working with your advisor on getting that set up. Um, and then one last question for you, Casey, before we move on to um, more of an industry-related question. Um, we've had some questions for students who are not in professional flight. Are they able to take the coursework or re register for the courses related to pro flight? And if not, what are their other opportunities to do that while they're here at Purdue? I don't know, Brian, if you want to, to jump in here and answer, I can answer, but it's not going to be as detailed as yours. 
Yeah. <clears throat> so as of right now, we don't have the resources to offer our flight courses to students outside of the professional flight degree pro program. Um, we do encourage students that are interested in pursuing certification at whatever level to uh, simply walk across the, the airport to Purdue Aviation. Um, most of the students um, or most of the instructors that are teaching at Purdue Aviation are students that are in our program. And so the quality of the education, the quality of the training, the uh, the rigor and the, uh, the awareness of the knowledge aspects are, are, are fairly uh, substantial in, uh, in, 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 in their training program as well. So they, they have much more flexibility, much more availability. Uh, but at this time, um, the flight training conducted within our coursework uh, has to be restricted to flight students only. Sure, and, and Brian, Purdue Aviation is a, a private company that just utilizes the airport, correct? Correct, yeah. Okay, cool, good to know. All right, so um, we've had uh, several questions come in, and, and you you all uh, have mentioned different connections to, to different companies and industry-related partnerships, and I just want to get a sense of what kind of partnerships exist or, and then in relation to our career fair that we typically have for, for aviation technology, um, what are some companies you see recruiting our students? Then we'll talk to our students as well about what experiences they've had. So Brian, we'll start with you and, and go run down the line then. Yeah, I, I would say that the, uh, the, we have existing relationships with all uh, regional providers, uh, regional carriers with the major airlines, uh, as well as the legacy airlines. Um, we, we try really hard to establish um, value added uh, connections with those uh, industry uh, partners. Uh, the, a great example of that is a, a really a recent announcement with Frontier Airlines and, and there's an opportunity that's sole source to Purdue uh, at this time that a student that graduates for, from Purdue University can have a direct pathway into Frontier Airlines going to a major airline instead of going through the traditional track of working with the regional airline for a certain period of time and then again picked up by a major. So, so that was announced uh, about uh, maybe two weeks ago um, and are, they're currently interviewing um, students that are in the process of uh, getting ready to graduate. Um, there's a process through airlineapps.com where students would uh, submit their application and it requires certain you know, approvals from, uh, or not approvals, but recommendation letters from faculty members and things of that nature. And then there's a process for them to get, uh, to have an opportunity to, uh, to engage with uh, a major airline uh, moving forward. Uh, outside of that, we have lots of internships, lots of opportunities for students. Um, most of the students within our program are going to serve some sort of a role in a flight capacity. Um, flight instructing is a very common situation working uh, on the front lines of a 135 operator, uh, if that's available, working in crew scheduling or, or uh, dispatch operations, things of that nature, uh, to try to get a more well-rounded perspective of what the industry is and all the players involved. All right, thanks, Brian. And Mike, you mentioned some different companies and, and partnerships as well. Do you want to expand on those any, at all? Oh, yes. In fact, uh, several of the companies come into our job fairs, and of course, they've been doing that virtual here lately. But uh, as far as the Boeings, the Lockheeds, Texron, uh, all those companies have had uh, at points, different points, they've had internships for our students as far as summer. Texron, even last summer during COVID, they still maintained their internships. They just had uh, the students had been selected that originally were going to go to Wichita. Actually, they had them just stay in Indianapolis, and they, they were able to still complete their internships. Uh, presently, uh, something else that was put on the back burner because of our, our COVID, but uh, working a, a discussion with FedEx in Indianapolis, they're interested in setting up internships with our students down there. So uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, in fact, almost weekly, we'll get a contact from our industry partners, whether it's an airline or, you know, engine manufacturer or airframer, whatever the case might be to let us know that there's either some internships about to drop and that we should be making our students aware of it or that we have, or even uh, permanent positions that are dropping and that they need to be paying close attention to. So that's kind of the, th the stuff we've been looking at, Ryan. And, and even with, you know, you're hearing the sad news with some of the layoffs and, and things like that. But during this whole thing, our students have been staying uh, very well. They've been being picked up. They've been hired. You know, some of the jobs were delayed just because they were trying to get the COVID under control and get the vaccines out. But as far as uh, just recently, three or four other jobs have dropped for our students and they'll be, as soon as they graduate in May, they're going right into a position with the GE. Actually, one's going to GE, uh, Lockheed, and then there's one going to Boeing. So, and that's just the ones I know of off the top of my head. So that's kind of what's going on with it, Ryan. 
Oh, that's good to hear that our students and our soon to be graduates are still getting out there. And and John, we had a question in our chat about you know things related to like SpaceX and those you know newer emerging technologies. And do um, you want to comment on that and and what our students can potentially get involved in here with that? Yeah, thanks, Ryan, for uh, posing the question. I saw that too in the chat. Um, uh, just to dovetail in, I don't want to punt the question, I'll come back to it, but to dovetail into what uh, Mike and Brian were saying, um, I oversee our uh, professional internship or pro professional experience requirement here of all of our graduates. Um, all of our graduates uh, or all of our students here at Purdue, um, no matter what their major, are required to gain some sort of professional experience slash internship uh, during their four years here at Purdue. Um, this has been a little challenging. Now, this is a graduation requirement, but it's been a little challenging in light of COVID with companies putting hiring of interns and other non-essentials on, on pause. Um, but where I feel this is helpful is, I mean, we started to see this even come back around where internships are available. Uh, there's a virtual or flex opportunity. Uh, but what this does is this gets our students motivated to get out in the field, to get away from just coming to school, go to class, and, and then leave in four years, it gets them out there. And we have connections with several uh, industry players, uh, Textron, Lycoming, um, several, several others of the majors uh, that, that we work with. And they know that this is a graduation requirement for our students. So they avail opportunities for them in an internship style program, either uh, over a couple weeks throughout a semester or predominantly over the summer. And what this does is this uh, puts our students in their facilities. And what tends to happen, and I can speak from personal experience from the other side of the fence, from industry side, once you get an intern, you know, you feel like, okay, I don't necessarily need to pay them. It could be an unpaid internship experience. And, and there's some flexibility in hiring them for a short amount of time. And once employers and industry uh, personnel see the quality of our students. It's more than just knowledge that we're giving them, right? It's the knowledge, skills, and abilities. And once they see the combination of those skills and abilities that our students have along with the knowledge, um, that tends to materialize very quickly into a job opportunity post-graduation that maybe didn't even exist prior to that student coming there. It's like they become so accustomed to having our student enmeshed in the industry uh, and within their company uh, that they hate to see them go at the end of the internship. So uh, even of the internships that I've sort of overseen and checked off with the advisors over this past semester, it's amazing how, you know, I don't have an exact number, but in excess of 40% of those have already been offered jobs upon graduation as a direct result of their internship requirement. So um, my role is to help bring in more companies into the fold. And as we begin to look at other emerging aviation and aerospace technologies, um, you know, we are going to be looking beyond the, the bounds of Earth, right? So um, with SpaceX and Blue Origin and all those new age aerospace companies sort of emerging, I think the things that continue to cause our graduates to stand out um, with the skills and abilities to match the superior knowledge that they're gaining. It's not just book knowledge, right? It's the skills and abilities to complement their knowledge. And, and that combination is one that we're interested in continuing to showcase to the, to the industry. Um, to that end, one of the things our department has committed to uh, is next year hosting a large industry symposium where we attempt to address the upcoming pilot and professional shortage that we are going to be experiencing in aviation. COVID just sort of delayed that. It didn't stop it. It didn't make the shortage of professional technicians and aerospace um, professionals and pilots. But that shortage still exists. It's just delayed. Um, and, and Purdue's going to host um, uh, you know, a biennial symposium here that is going to bring together the industry makers to not only attempt to lay out, frame the problem and move forward in one voice on how we want to tackle this as, as an industry. But we're dovetailing that in so that we can showcase the superior quality of student that we put out here at Purdue, be, be it from the flight program, the AET program, the UAS program, the management or finance program. And so we, we are going to dovetail those two events in nicely. And 
part of the focus of that is how do we address that that emerging frontier uh, currently occupied by companies like Blue Origin and, and SpaceX and the like. So uh, I see Purdue continuing to be on the cutting edge of that and um, continuing to show our students superior knowledge and skills and abilities. And, and that's something that I, I think is important. You can learn stick and rudder flying skills from anywhere. But what I think Purdue does best is complement our um, all around knowledge with skills and abilities. And so our, our students really come out well-rounded more than just pilots from a flight program or uh, um, AMPs from a maintenance program, right? They come out so much more than that, that no matter where their career path leads them, um, they'll be equipped to be on the cutting edge of, of candidates for whatever job they seek. So hopefully that answers your question. No, I think it does, and definitely, definitely speaks to the abilities that overall Purdue students will gain. Not, like you said, not just technically sound, but you know, good leaders and good managers and good, you know, just overall employees and, and professionals in their field. So that's good to hear. Um, and then I'm going to turn it to our students real quick, just to get a sense of you know internships or you know as Jacob's about to graduate, what he's got coming up. So Peter, we'll start with you. I think you uh, we chatted a little bit. You said you have a, an internship coming up for this summer. You can tell us a little bit about that. That's correct. I can't really speak about any uh, past internship experience I have, um, but I am going to be working with Techstrand Aviation in Arizona this summer. Um, so students in the School of Aviation and Transportation Technology will receive a weekly newsletter from Vicki Gilbert, who's our recruiting uh, placement and internship coordinator at the School of Aviation and Transportation Technology. And what that newsletter includes is uh, Opportunities, opportunities that were sent to sent to her from uh, industry professionals, along with events that are going to be hosted uh, for Purdue students and other students, um, information sessions and things of that nature. Um, and so with this, there, there's a lot of resources um, outside of the School of Aviation Transportation Technology uh, as well, including uh, the career, uh, Center for Career Opportunities, which has peer consultants that are willing to help with mock interviews uh, polishing up your resume, LinkedIn, things like that. Um, but going back to all the opportunities that we have in the industry, I think the two that are, are most commonly thought of are airlines and aircraft manufacturers. Uh, but there are opportunities for students at cargo and logistics companies like uh, UPS, FedEx, and Amazon, uh, aviation consulting firms, asset management, aircraft leasing, um, and then also airports as well. Uh, so there's a lot for students to... to um, to look into, especially with aviation management. All right, that's awesome. Thanks for that rundown. I really appreciate it. And then again, mentioning the, the CCO, as we call it, for the, the career services support as well. Um, and then Jacob, you know, like I mentioned, you're about to graduate. What do you have coming up for yourself? Yeah, so uh, I took advantage of a lot of those opportunities that Peter mentioned. I uh, went to the CCO, uh, got help with my resume, and watched, Vicky, watched for Vicky's emails. And last spring, applied for an internship at Delta, uh, was offered the internship, and then COVID hit, so that did not uh, end up taking place. Um, but I've gotten to know uh, an individual over the last about four summers, maybe, that I've worked for, uh, a little bit on and off. And he kind of offered me an internship position all summer after that happened, and worked with him over the summer. And he ended up offering me a full-time position, said, you know, when you graduate, come on down. Um, start working for me and in between here uh, I've been going down working for him about um, a week a month when I can um, and he owns and operates a Challenger 605 so the goal there is going to be um, hopefully to fly for him the path of building my time that's that's the critical step is building time so not quite sure how I'm going to get there yet that's kind of kind of a unique path that I don't think many people take so um, figuring out how to build time, but the end goal is corporate route right now uh, with him. All right, good to hear. Hope that works out for you pretty soon. That that sounds like a good opportunity. Um, just real quick, and turn to micro. Uh, we I think we we should hear it in the chat for everybody for professional flight gets the iPad, the electronic bag that we get for those students. But do you have any computer recommendations uh, for AET? And then Casey will turn to you for any other recommendations for other majors as well. Oh, yeah, for our computer, basically, we've got the different uh, computer terminals actually in the lab. But really, uh, if you've just got a good laptop for we've got, uh, of course, our Wi-Fi is, is pretty well available anywhere on campus. 
And then, so any of that type of computer technology, then we, then I still have some iPads that I use in the power plant lab. And we're, we're tying, we have iPads, we actually have some of the, we've got Android, so notes and things like that, because we want students to have the, the access to what the technology is going to see as far as they, once they get out into the industry. Because, you know, if they're in the maintenance network or whatever, they're going to be using, you know, the tough books and the, the different iPads and all that with their maintenance instruction. And even the Air Force is using iPads as far as their their tech orders and things like that for aircraft maintenance now. So uh, even though the iPads aren't available now currently on the uh, AET side, we still have them in the different labs just to give that uh, get that familiarity to folks and uh, get them prepped because that's all the technology that they're going to see. And and if you look at how these engines, uh, the turbine engines have changed over the years, just in the last 15 to 20 years, just the in, incorporation of different avionics on aircraft with the engines and and the electronic controls and the digital controls, it's imperative that students have a, a good understanding of the we would call it avionics in the in the maintenance field or career field, but you know it's basically the the electronics, the computers that are running these aircraft and these engines. So that's kind of what we're looking at, Ryan. And I was going to say too, we've we've got students just to back up a second. We've got two students that just. One was hired by SpaceX, and then another student's going to Colorado, which is an upstart for another one of the space uh, companies. So uh, there, we've got folks that have been hired at NASA just within uh, the last couple of years too. All right, that's good to hear. Got some good, good opportunities, well known around the world there. And then Casey, for other majors, aviation management, uh, finance, UAS, what do we got for those? So my general response is, a, a laptop that you know how to use. Um, so make sure that you're familiar with it when you get there. Don't wait till your first exam and you unwrap it and don't know how to turn it on. Um, I the the students may Jacob and Peter may have more insight uh, directly into um, you know how they're doing the work uh, and and what type of uh, laptops or computers are working best for the the individual work that you're doing i can speak about that if you like um so for aviation management i would say that most of the technology that we're using is microsoft excel and tableau um so with that both both apple and uh, windows computers can run that so if you are currently using an apple computer stick with that and then if you're currently using a Windows computer, I would I would advise that you stick with that. So whatever you're comfortable with, and like Casey said, don't don't wait till the last minute to figure out how to use it, um, and make sure that you have those softwares already installed. All right, good to know. Thank you, um, Brian. I'm going to turn it back to you. We, I got an email earlier today with a question um, about international students and options for internships or employment after graduation in the U.S. once they're done. Yeah, so um, that's, that's always a mixed bag because it largely depends on the type of visa that the person comes in on. And so it's really an individual question um, and it's hard to answer until we get to that point. We, we have, to the point of graduation, we have in the past um, worked with students. I mean, um, we've had students that are uh, on our full-time staff instructing in the past that, that we've sponsored and they've been here through the citizenship process. Um, we've also had students that I've worked with um, airlines that will sponsor. Um, it, it, it depends on the particular context of where they're trying to get in a, you know, a, a position as, as well as the type of visa that they're on at the time. And so those are questions that you'd wanna start asking earlier rather than later. Um, you probably wanna start asking those questions in your, in your freshman year uh, rather than waiting until your senior year. And, and I do wanna add one additional thing to the computer question. Uh, I always advocate that students know where the nearest computer lab is to them on campus because it, you know, Murphy's law says that you're going to have an assignment that's due in 20 minutes and your computer is going to crash. And so if you know where the nearest computer lab is, you can make a mad dash to it and still get the assignment turned in on time. So just a word of advice. <laughs> I think that's a good thing to, to keep in mind. And, and John, you wanted to add something about related to computer and technology things as well. Why don't you go ahead with that? Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Just briefly, um, you know, to echo everybody else's comments, uh, a capable computer 
uh, that you're comfortable with, that you know well in advance and have backup options for in case they fail. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out, because I think a lot of people are asking about technology, uh, computer related questions because of the uh, recent thrust into virtual that I think everybody has experienced. One of the things I'm proud of here being uh, faculty at Purdue and being on board and sort of coming on board right before the pandemic hit full time uh, is that the, the School of Aviation Transportation Technology was one of the two programs that was back on campus first. Uh, I think our flight program did wonders to bring people back, but we cannot teach people how to fix, maintain, uh, or fly aircraft virtually. So um, I think one of the things I'm most proud of is how we came to campus first and we were allowed back on campus in the middle of last summer in in-person instruction environments. And, and yes, we were shooting from the hip and developing safety protocol and, and trying to uh, abide by guidelines. But in many cases, uh, we were the cutting edge here at the at School of Aviation Transportation Technology, even ahead of Purdue. So a lot of the recommendations we came up with were ultimately approved higher up. But um, one of the things I'm most proud about is that our classes remain and still are uh, in person. Uh, a lot of early on classes were booked as in person classes and then uh, did what I will call bait and switch. We're, we're going to just switch to virtual. Um, and I, I'm proud to say that none of my classes and none of my colleagues' classes ended up in, in that boat. Now, where it made sense, uh, we did virtual, um, but I think far and away, most of our classes and laboratories were taught in person. I, I think we all value the experience of in-person instruction and, and in a safe and responsible manner in, in light of COVID. And so um, this isn't something where uh, like other universities out there where they were completely co closed. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to be a part of protecting Purdue and doing so in person. So while technology is important and it, it really is, I think a, a footnote is that um, we continued when many others across the country uh, decided to not. And, and I think our continued success uh, is, is owed to a lot of the hard work and effort that made sure we were able to do that. So just a quick side note, but uh, it's something that I think Purdue did well, and specifically the School of Aviation Transportation Technology led all others in Purdue University and in, in bringing students back as soon as possible. So hope that helps. No, it definitely does. I think it was early July or mid-July when we had students who were, you know, kind of interrupted in that middle of the, of the spring semester that came back to finish out that coursework. And, and Brian, I think we talked about that in our last YouTube broadcast last spring that we did for this department. So yeah, it's good to, good to know we're, we're still focused on those types of things. And Mike, it looks like you want to add something as well? Oh, yes. In fact, I was just so proud to, to work with our students and faculty and staff because, you know, like John was saying, for, we were the first ones back on campus. We actually had students that could not graduate last May because the labs had not been completed. So we had to get the permission from the provost. So that's why what John mentioned as far as getting our protocols together to where they'd allow us to bring folks safely back onto campus. We did not have anybody that ended up testing COVID, testing positive and were pulled out of classes anytime during the summer. So we were able to get the majority of those students back. And we, we'd actually made some uh, amendments to some plans of study. So because people had jobs that were waiting for them and they had to graduate, they had to have that degree. So uh, they, they actually graduated and a couple of them were able, their jobs ended up being postponed, their start dates. So then they actually came back on campus and finished up with their labs to where they completed their certification. So it was, uh, I'll tell you what, it was a very proud time for all of us to be part of Purdue. Very good. And Mike, I'm actually going to stick with you. We got a question in the chat. Um, and, and as of right now, as everybody might be aware of our, with COVID and travel restrictions, things like that, um, we do have what's called the Office of Globalization in the Polytechnic. That's our study abroad office, but everything's on hold right now. But I want to, Mike, ask you, we had a question about uh, study abroad opportunities related to AET that may have been offered in, in the past and what might be offered in the future once we're able to do that again. Oh, okay. As soon as the, you know, the travel bans were lifted to where we can participate again, we always had the the travel abroad where, uh, you know, Dr. Sturkenberg and a couple other faculty would take a, a group and they would actually go to the UK and actually the Netherlands and they would 
uh, tour that over the spring break. So, uh, in fact, that's going to be right back on schedule just as soon as uh, we get get the release to to open up the travel again. So, and even uh, before that, I've got a couple. Of, it's not travel abroad, but it's I've got some uh, bus trips that I actually set up for AET or you know professional flight, whoever's available to go on that trip. But we uh, one of them's to just across state lines over to Springfield, Illinois, to where we take them to a, an operational test cell where they can see uh, after burning engines, F-16 engines on, on those test cells, and they can get a perspective of what's going on there. So um, those are about to open up, uh, it looks like this fall. So we'll be back on back on schedule and uh, getting that all that incorporated again. And then our normal just local trips where Caterpillars and, and GE and all that should be opened up back in the fall too. All right, thanks, Mike. Yeah, and, and if you want to, the uh, there's the Office of Globalization Department website um, that lists previous experiences related to all of our different majors and departments. So yeah, take a look at that and see where we've been and where we're hopefully going to be able to go in the near future as well. Um, now, one one more question for Casey related to a senior capstone project. I think that's one thing that we've incorporated in our plans of study here in the Polytechnic. Um, how does that look for most of our students? What when does that typically take you know take take place in that senior year? Yeah. So. Um... Depending on the major, uh, that may be a one semester capstone um, divided into two two parts, so two eight week courses um, that they would complete in their final semester. Um, for some of our plans of study, that is a, a two part capstone, and so the first part of that is the prep work, and the second part is the completion of the the project. Um, so it it really is dependent on which majors um, you are. All right, well, good to know that that's something we do. And J Jacob, uh, would you want to tell us a little bit about your project that you worked on? Yeah, so I'm currently working on it right now. Um, our capstone is 494 and 495, so it's split, like Casey said. First eight weeks was our project proposal, and then the second eight weeks were um, finishing putting it together and working on it and submitting it. And what we're doing this semester, and I believe they did last semester as well, is the whole class is forming a podcast series. So. Um, everybody's chosen a topic of interest to them, and we're going out into industry and interviewing people, whether they work at um, an airline or corporate, anybody with industry experience, we're interviewing them about our topic of choice and including some research that we've done as well uh, and putting together a podcast series. And then we send that out to industry as well. And we have uh, chief pilots, line pilots, retired pilots, uh, different people at the airlines that will then view all of our podcasts and give us substantial feedback. Um, we saw examples from last semester and I was surprised uh, how willing everybody was to uh, review our work and give us um, feedback on, on our projects. All right, it sounds like a good way to get connected out to industry as well and hear from, from different folks. And Mike, you wanna add something else as well? Oh, sure. I was just going to talk about our capstone with the AET side. We've got a 496, AT 496 and 497. So, for instance, some of our uh, projects have actually ended up being, I've got a mezzanine that that, uh, this ended up going across a couple of years to get it finalized, but we, we had several different uh, capstone teams. And when it came to fruition, we actually spent $450,000 to to put a mezzanine in the power plant lab. So that's where our capstone projects uh, come into play. And they also, uh, you know, we've had uh, test cells renovated. We've had uh, control panels uh, renovated. In fact, our host tonight, he wrote a report uh, or an article a few years back on, we had a collaboration with some aero engineers and they were over for a capstone and we did what we called a shoebox project. So. That was actually we we completely revised the control panel to run the PT6 turboprop that's in the indoor test cell. So uh, those capstones are uh, they they actually we do get some industry partners that have input that we've worked with, and we've got several projects that we just if we don't have an industry partner we just use it to as a renovation. We've got uh, one of my project teams this spring is actually working to bring in a military aircraft that we can either put on a pedestal to display or we can use it as far as some uh, fighter experience uh, to uh, just show some of that technology. So those are just some of the things that we've looked at from the uh, the Capstone project. All right, thank you for sharing, I appreciate it. Um, let's go back to our students, just get a sense of what it's like to be a student at Purdue. What kind of things are you doing? What kind of organizations and clubs have you joined? And Peter, we'll start with you. 
All right. So I, some advice that I would give to students is find an organization that is related to your major and then find one that's related to your passion. Um, I'm actually involved with two organizations that are related to my major, um, Women in Aviation, which I'm the treasurer of, and then Alpha Eta Rho, which is a professional aviation fraternity on campus. Um, now with this, there's, there's thousands of organizations on campus. Um, one of them, which is uh, Purdue Polytechnic Ambassadors, which uh, is why I'm doing this event tonight. Um, but other than clubs and organizations, I would say that sports is pretty heavy on campus, whether you're interested in it or not. Um, so definitely get involved with that and go to a few games. You don't have to know the sport, but um, just get a group of friends and go, go have some fun. Um, and then I, I think that there, there's plenty of events on campus um, that the per Purdue Student uh, Union Board will put on um, throughout the year. There's concerts uh, when there was uh, no pandemic, obviously, but there, there's a lot of ways to get involved on campus. Um, you just have to get out there and do it. All right, good to know. And then Jacob, for yourself, you know, finished up your senior year. What you had a, a, quite a bit of time to experience lots of different things here. Yeah, Peter. Uh, Peter hit hit it on the head pretty well. Uh, there's a lot to do around campus. My biggest thing that I would tell um, incoming students is just get out there, meet as many people as you can. There's roughly eight thousand people that are in the same boat as you. They're all coming um, from all over the place, different countries, all fifty states. Uh, everybody's in the same boat as you. So get out there. Join some clubs. Um, you're here for school. That's the most important thing. So study and do well in school, but uh, also take as much of advantage of your free time as you can to get involved as and as much as you can. Figure out what you like to do, um, and and fill your schedule. It's uh it's different than high school. You're not always busy eight to three every day, uh, and then three to six for practice. So um, your schedule will look a lot different. So uh, take advantage of that. Would be my biggest piece of advice. And get to know your professors. That's a good one too. <laughs> yeah, I think that's definitely a good thing. They're, as you can see, they're just normal people teaching you these cool things. Um, so yeah, get to know them for sure. Um, and in case we had a question from the chat, when I ask you before we, we wrap up with one last question for everybody, um, for students who are admitted to professional flight or really any of our majors and also the honors college, um, how does that work with plan of study in, in terms of completing those honors requirements as well? Yeah, so um, if if a student comes in um, and, and they're also in the Honors College, they will have an Honors College advisor in addition to their academic advisor in uh, the School of Aviation and Transportation Technology. Um, they will meet with both of their advisors to, um, to plan out a semester. Uh, we do have a lot of general course requirements uh, that all of our students are um, required to, uh, to, to complete. Some of those course uh, general courses are offered in uh, in the honors format. Um, they uh, they can also speak with professors about um, about having other courses uh, count for for honors credit as well. So um, it, it's not as difficult, I think, as uh, um, I know when I first started uh, looking at uh, a student's plan of study who was in the honors college. It was pretty overwhelming. Um, once I started looking at it and broke it down, spoke with their advisor to try to understand things a little bit better, um, it's not it's not that difficult to fulfill both of those responsibilities. Okay, that's good to know that they get some support from both the Honor College and, and the department here and work with the faculty members on getting those, those courses completed, so that's good. Um, so one question we always end up with when, we, when we're doing these broadcasts is, you know, what kind of advice would you give to incoming students uh, for this department and just Purdue in general to be successful? And Peter and, and Jacob kind of mentioned, you know, get involved and, and meet some, meet those new folks as well that are joining you as freshmen. Um, so we'll turn it over to our to couple of faculty and advisors to see what's your advice for, for our students to be successful here and Brian we'll start with you yeah I, I always give the same three pieces of advice to any student and I, I share the same thing with the freshman students that I deal with and it's pretty simple it's it's go to class like just you know go to class pay attention in class and that those two pieces right there are the, the most critical because typically a faculty member that's or, or an instructor is going to be teaching the class they're going to hit on the most important things that they feel 
during the actual time that they're teaching because it's it's valuable time to them. I know that my time is valuable to me. So when I'm in front of a class, I'm not up just I'm not there just to talk. I'm there to share what I believe is important. So go to class, pay attention in class. It means you have to put your stuff away, right? Instagram and 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 TikTok and and your phone and all the other things that distract you from whatever the things may be, um, and then and then take take moderately good notes and study a little, right? You, you do those you do those three things, um, you're going to get A's and B's uh, pretty pretty easily throughout your coursework. Um, and then I would I, I would echo something that Jacob already mentioned. That's you know getting to know uh, your professors and reaching out to them early. Don't wait until two weeks before the end of the semester. Um, talk to them earlier rather than later, and uh, it's a collaborative effort, and they're they're there to support you. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, I think going to class, is, as Jacob mentioned, your schedule is not going to be you go and you show up and then you're done at the end of the day. You got to pay attention to that schedule and, and show up to your classes. Good, good thing to keep in mind. Uh, Mike, we'll turn it over to you now. Well, I was just going to kind of echo what Brian was saying because. Um, now, our accreditation requires mandatory attendance, so uh, that's why you heard us talking about how important it was to get back on campus for the labs, and that was because we had to actually uh, show incompletes for students until they completed those labs, so it's important to get to class, and then, you know, so many folks are coming into the program, and as you get in there, you may just be learning that uh, you're, you're you're coming across as far as you might find something that interests you that you had not even thought about. So uh, there's so many different things that we cover in class and then so many different areas that you'll be able to be exposed to while you're here. So it's just uh, keep your head on a swivel, uh, kind of be a sponge, absorb everything that you can absorb from the program and from the folks that are here. Uh, Cause I think uh, you, you can tell just from the, the some of the interaction tonight, we love what we do here and we, we look forward to kind of grooming our future generation. So we want you to go out and make us proud back here at Purdue. All right, thank you, Mike and Casey. So my, my number one piece of advice, which seems uh, insignificant right now, maybe, um, use your Purdue email account. Uh, we have a lot of people who will forward their emails to a Gmail account or a different account. You're going to miss our emails. Um, we use a system to email students, uh, and those are notorious for filtering out uh, Gmail and, and other um, providers are notorious for, for filtering out our emails. Uh, I send emails six and seven times uh, and don't receive a response from a student until the deadline day. Um, and then the student reaches out to me and says, I haven't heard anything from you. Uh, well, I've sent seven emails, but you forwarded everything to your Gmail account. So that is, uh, that's sort of my, uh, my one overarching thing. Um, the other things that I want to touch on are ask for help. Um, if you're struggling with anything academically, um, mental health concerns, um, you know, you, you're, you're just having, you had a, your apartment flooded. Um, whatever it is, reach out and ask for help. There are plenty of people um, ready and willing to help. There are plenty of resources across campus. Um, instructors are super understanding when you reach out the day something happened and you're missing class. They're not quite as understanding when you wait until the last week of class and you, set, you contact them and tell them you've missed the last four weeks and what can I do. Um, it's also hard to recover from that. So it's much easier to recover from the, I've missed two, the last two classes um, than it is you know, six weeks later. Um, and then the third thing is um, you can be whoever you want to be. Um, you are coming into a new environment. Nobody knows you. Um, you don't have to carry any baggage with you from high school. You can be a different person. You can you can like things that you maybe didn't like in high school because you know your friends didn't like that thing. Um, so just know that you can you can come to Purdue. You can be yourself, um, and uh, you know you will be accepted and find a group of friends that uh, that will accept you for that. Thanks, Casey. I think that's important to know. And, and back to your point about asking for help. Yeah, there's your advisor, there's uh, your faculty members, our staff here in the Office of Recruitment, Retention, and Diversity. There's supplemental instruction. There's the Academic Success Center. There's 
uh, mentoring and tutoring programs around the campus. So you're going to have support in whatever capacity you might need. So yeah, reach out to folks and then we'll help you find those resources when you need them. All right, I'm going to turn it back to our, our two students. Jacob, we'll start with you for what else you want to add for, for our discussion here. Yeah, my last piece of advice, Casey kind of just touched on there is take advantage of all the resources Purdue has to offer. There's so many, there's, there's resources I guarantee you I have no clue we offer. Um, there's fun ones like we have um, 3D printing available to Polytechnic students. Um, you can go in and use that, that's kind of cool. Um, and then we have like the more serious ones like the Center for Career Opportunities, um, PUSH and CAPS that they talked about. There's computer labs on campus, group study rooms, plenty of libraries. Um, just take advantage of everything that's out there. Um, career fairs, go to those as a freshman. You probably aren't expecting to get an internship as a freshman, but a lot of the recruiters that we have come to campus, they're the same people that come every year. And if you talk to them and get to know them, when you go your junior, senior year looking for an internship or a job, they're going to know you, recognize you, and they'll be more familiar. And it's not going to be your first time being nervous going up and handing somebody your resume and giving like your elevator speech. Um, you're going to be used to the process. So go to that as a freshman, sophomore. Um, take advantage of everything that we have to offer. There's so much out there. Yeah, I think that's a good piece of advice and get out there as soon as you can to those different things. All right, thanks. And then Peter, last but not least, what do you got for us? Yeah, so I just have a general piece of advice that goes kind of hand in hand with getting involved and that's to keep an open mind. Because um, going to college is gonna be a new experience for you and you're gonna have a lot thrown at you at one time. Um, so getting involved with those organizations, you'll meet new people, um, which can sort of build your support network and also help you find what you're most interested in. Um, like I said earlier, there's going to be events and information sessions, and be sure to attend those. Um, as a freshman, like Jacob said, go to the career fairs because that will help you develop a passion for uh, what you're most passionate about. Um, and that's that's kind of what helped me find my passion uh, for what I want to do with my career. All right, thank you, Peter, and, and thank you at all for your piece of advice and everything you've shared tonight. Um, so that does wrap up our discussion and our broadcast tonight. Um, thank you again to our viewers for joining us and for submitting all the great questions that you have in the chat. Um, hope you gained a lot of good information and insight to our School of Aviation Transportation Technology here. Um, so thank you again to our awesome panelists for sharing all that information and experience that they've had. Um, thanks to John, our technical director, for running everything behind the scenes and responding in the chat as well. Um, and if we didn't get to your question, I know we had a lot of information out there and a lot of questions submitted. Um, feel free to follow, uh, follow up with us uh, at our techrecruit at Purdue edu email address we'll be able to respond to those questions later um, we also have some other sessions coming up um, for admitted students if you haven't joined us for one of our admitted student sessions we have coming one coming up this thursday evening that i'll be hosting um, student to student chats every monday night so we still have those coming up in the future um, we also have a student life focused broadcast coming up on april 13th so we'll have some of our student ambassadors talking about all the different experiences they've had here at the university so far um, so you can find all those uh, opportunities to engage with us on our admitted student page and you can rewatch this broadcast by going to polytechnic.purdue.edu slash live and find the same link for um, the school of aviation transportation technology and just a quick reminder for those admitted students, uh, you have until May 1st to accept your offer of admission to Purdue. So just want to say thank you all again for joining us tonight. Have a great rest of your evening and boiler up. <laughs>